The year is 1973. You are an art student in Rhode Island with a form of autism that is currently named after an Austrian war criminal. You are relaxing in your dorm after a long day of clam fishing, or whatever Rhode Island residents do, when your ketamine dealer, Chris, grabs you by your offensively skinny neck and says, Hey dumbass, let's make music for trans baristas who microdose lava lamp fluid. You are too afraid to decline this offer and form one of the most influential bands in history, the Artistics. But wait, you say, accidentally moving to New York on purpose? What if we made a band that had more people in it? You suddenly notice that Chris's girlfriend has the goofiest legs you've ever seen, so you make her learn to play bass guitar at gunpoint. Congratulations, you've just founded critically acclaimed art rock band Talking Heads. My god, what have I done? Talking Heads was founded in 1975 and was comprised of four main members. Chris France, drummer and unfortunately not a ketamine dealer as far as I know. Tina Weymouth, bassist and accidental early David Bowie cosplayer, some other guy. And frontman David Byrne, who, between writing musicals about Filipino diplomats and hogging off to architecture, occasionally finds the time to shout propaganda that turns ceramic majors into jewel-addicted anarchists. The band would go on to be one of the few truly legendary American bands, but of course every success story has humble beginnings. Their first gig was opening for an underground indie band called simply The Raymonds. In 1976, Talking Heads officially signed to Sire Records, a label that seemed to be physically incapable of not signing any act that appealed primarily to British incels with undiscovered homosexual <laughs> desires. They also signed Madonna. It's worth noting that this entire time, David would mail threatening VHS tapes to Tina, in which he would unveil his nefarious schemes to destroy all of Western culture if she didn't keep auditioning to to be in the band she was already in. With their first big record deal under their belts, the trio and their friend Jerry released their first single, which literally cannot be pronounced using any human language. It's called Love, Arrow, Building on Fire, and it only bangs a little bit. Finally, the people of 1976 could get their groove on, and shake their funky haunches to the sound of cybernetic Mozart conducting a chorus of flatulent pixies. After receiving much praise from both suburban cocaine addicts and their lesbian daughters who own Snakes, Talking Heads were finally ready to drop their first album. It was called Talking Heads 77, so they wouldn't forget what year it was. To this day, this album is mostly known for the single Psycho Killer, which features schizophrenic rambling and other European nonsense. Luckily, it was the 70s, so people were into that kind of thing. There was a rumor that the song was about an actual serial killer who was really harshing the vibe of New York City at the time, but that was just a ludicrous urban legend. It was actually about how David Byrne assassinated John F. Kennedy. In 1978, the band met Brian Eno. He sort of became their honorary fourth member who wasn't Jerry. Eno is the Kevin Bacon of music, in that literally everyone has worked with him, and he was in R.I.P.D. Talking Heads would go on to have Brian Eno produce their most successful records, including more songs about buildings and food, Fear of Music, Remain in Light, and of course, Conway Twitty's Greatest Hits Volume 1. This was around the time that genre basically became the N-word of music. Nobody had any idea what the fuck was going on. Yesterday, Talking Heads was punk rock, and suddenly they're post-punk? Wait, what the fuck is New Wave? Is this techno? Why is that guy playing bongos? Are there supposed to be this many instruments? Are you my mom or my dad? Needless to say, this explosion of subgenres and self-righteous music journalism had sort of a head-on garbage truck collision with David Byrne's wacky chromosomes, and Talking Heads became the messiah of experimentation in pop music. These guys did it all. Polyrhythms, disco funk, darker and, dare I say, gooier sounds, and of course the ever-famous Talking Heads to Afrobeat Pipeline. You want a weird-ass song? You got it, Buster. Call 1-800-PRONOUNS-IN-BIO and submit literally any meat sweat fever dream, and Talking Heads can make a bop and a half out of it. Do you need a cummy funk jam that sounds like the theme song to an 80s cop show about a violent people's uprising against their government oppressors a la the Irish Republican Army? We got it. Are you craving a new wave hit about the about the about the about the about the, about the monotony of your eternal quest to live a suburban white-collar life? 
that takes on the format of an evangelical sermon, the tiny neck man's got you covered. Are you a precocious minx who desperately wants a backup contingency plan just in case your lead singer becomes too powerful and decides to fuck off to the Yukon to start a solo career? Well, Tina and Chris did that and it's called the Tom Tom Club. Right at the turn of the 80s, both Talking Heads and Splinter Group The Tom Tom Club released cult hits that would retroactively become some of the most iconic works of art in music history. The Tom Tom Club released Genius of Love, which is now one of the most sampled songs in hip-hop history, despite being the least hip-hop song of all time. Talking Heads released the music video for their single Once in a Lifetime, which is now one of the most instantly recognizable music videos ever due to its cummy graphics and Urkel dance. By the way, this music video was directed by Tony Basil, who made that cheerleading song and literally nothing else. So yeah, in the early 80s, all three members of Talking Heads were basically cementing themselves as mythological heroes of the music industry. Also, Jerry was there. After four straight years of absolutely mutilating the guts of the music scene, Talking Heads needed a break and a pack of motherfucking Newports. David Byrne retreated to a remote corner of the earth to solve mysteries with a talking dog, while Chris and Tina kept making music as the Tom Tom Club, desperately missing his friends. Jerry sacrificed Brian Eno to Ra the Sun God in a ritual to revive the band. The group came back together in 1983 to release new music. Brian Eno's Ghost went on to produce music for U2, because nothing says cutting edge and experimental like music that comes with your iPhone by default. The post-hiatus Talking Heads release was Speaking in Tongues, an album mostly remembered for its hit single Burning Down the House, which is famously the only song on rotation in small town supermarkets that doesn't make the cashiers want to eat glass. The tour that followed was documented in the famous concert film Stop Making Sense. It features a suit that swells up like Paula Deen's clitoris at the premiere of 12 Years a Slave. It starts off with Shawshank and mate David Byrne playing a cassette tape. He strums the git fiddle and stumbles around like someone sauced up uncle at your graduation party. Then slowly, the rest of the band joins in. Song by song, a new character in the Smash Bros roster of Talking Heads is revealed. Then come the session musicians playing indigenous instruments. And the show just gets bigger and more intricate until eventually you're just staring in awe at the angelic chorus of creative minds who have come together to bring a story to life through songs you already love. Also, it was directed by the guy who made cannibalism cool. Pop that monster energy prostate supplement, Grandpa, because this is where the story slows down by a lot. The Talking Heads album that released after Stop Making Sense literally does not matter. Around 1986, David Byrne directed a musical film called True Stories. It was about a man in a funny hat watching Texans do Texas stuff. John Goodman was in it, and that is literally all I know about this movie. Talking Heads released an album of the same name to serve as the soundtrack. In 1988, Talking Heads released their final album. It was called Naked, and was pretty much just the result of one white guy fucking around with Latin and African music to the point that even African and Latin American people were like, maybe we should just move on to ska music. In 1991, David Byrne announced, without the knowledge of his bandmates, that he was nuking Talking Heads out of existence. Chris didn't even realize that the band he was in had broken up until he read it in the Los Angeles Times, which is kind of like if your bitch wife Brenda left you via a viral BuzzFeed article. Give me my fucking kids back, Brenda. Tina and Chris wanted to keep releasing music as the Tom Tom Club, but Jerry was still there, so they toured and released music as just the Heads, borrowing vocalists from a bunch of other famous bands. David Byrne, still pissed off about not getting the recognition he deserved from assassinating JFK, sued the shit out of them. In 2002, Talking Heads were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and the band reunited one final time to play three of their songs that aren't once in a lifetime, so who fucking cares? To this day, David Byrne writes musicals and maintains a healthy solo career, while the Tom Tom Club also exists. Jerry, as far as I know, is still alive. 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 Still alive.